16th of December 1944, without warning a huge German attack surged through the Ardennes forest of Belgium and Luxembourg, striking a thinly held sector, the US front lines. American units, taken completely by surprise and massively outnumbered, either fell back in confusion or were cut off and destroyed in vicious battles. The attack was not supposed to happen. Since the German defeat in Normandy in August 1944 and retreat through France back to the Siegfried Line defences, the Germans were supposed to be a beaten force. US, British, Canadian and French forces had closed up to the Siegfried Line defences and started probing for a way through, aiming to fan out and race to the River Rhine before breaking fully into Germany. But Allied supply issues had given the Germans the breathing space they needed to stabilise the front. In the American sector of the line, the city of Aachen had been taken with difficulty, but US attacks had been decisively repulsed when they attempted to cut through the Hürtgen forest. By December 1944, offensive operations were largely halted by the onset of winter. The Ardennes, where Hitler had surprised the French and British in summer 1940 by running tank divisions through an area of Europe unsuitable for armoured warfare, was only lightly held by four US divisions including units recuperating from the Hürtgen meat grinder or green divisions recently arrived in Europe, gaining some limited patrol action experience in a quiet sector of the line. No one thought Hitler had the men and vehicles to attack West yet again, but though his units were under strength and short of fuel and much equipment, he planned a surprise winter attack towards the Allied supply port of Antwerp. Hitler's intention was to cut the US and British armies off from each other and capture their main supply centre, forcing them to the negotiating table. He chose December to launch the assault due to poor weather grounding Allied aircraft, which had been such an important factor in German defeats in the summer and autumn. And the Ardennes, because the Allies had not learned the lesson of 1940 and persisted in viewing the region as unsuitable for heavy armour. The German plan rested on quickly capturing two important road centres in the Ardennes to enable the Panzer and Volksgrenadier divisions to push rapidly west onto better tank country, to the Meuse River and on to Antwerp. The two towns were Saint-Vith and Bastogne. It was also imperative that American resistance be crushed speedily, and the Germans, short of fuel, quickly capture US fuel dumps to push the offensive forward. But the US Army was to prove immensely capable, even when massively outnumbered, and in several desperate actions managed to hold up German forces, ruining Hitler's careful timetable and allowing US and British reinforcements to contain what came to be called the Battle of the Bulge. Most people have heard of the heroic defence of Bastogne by the US 101st Airborne Division. The strategic road centre never fell to the Germans, and bypassing it cost them time they couldn't afford to lose. But few have heard of the Battle of Clairvaux, where US forces, surrounded and desperate, fought to the bitter end in a battle also dubbed the Ardennes Alamo. All the defenders were either killed or captured. But their sacrifice again caused holdups that the Germans could ill afford, contributing to the ruination of Hitler's plans. The pretty little town of Clairvaux lay about three miles behind the Ur River, which was the border between US and German forces. In this sector, the front line was defended by the 28th Infantry Division, which had been badly chewed up in the Battle of the Hürtgen Forest. The division, which was still recovering from its ordeal, covered 25 miles of the front, which was far too wide, covering the Ur and Zauer rivers. After a terrific German artillery barrage, the men of the 28th Infantry Division stubbornly held onto the ridge overlooking the Ur river as masses of Germans attempted to cross. The Germans suffered heavy casualties, but pressed home their attacks with determination, outnumbering the 28th by many times over. By the morning of the 17th of December, 
the 28th Infantry Division's three regiments were slowly being infiltrated and surrounded. Behind them, German forces had started to move into the rear areas, not only with infantry but also tracked assault guns that they had managed to bring across the river on temporary bridges. At the ancient town of Clovaux, US troops who had been on rest and relaxation leave were hastily gathered together for a defence of the vital settlement. But many instead chose to flee. They were joined by stragglers from smashed units retreating from the front in considerable disorder. German artillery was already falling on Clairvaux, adding to the confusion as reluctant rear area personnel were suddenly finding themselves being issued weapons and ammunition and told to take up defensive positions. A concerned Colonel Hurley Fuller, who was commanding the 28th Infantry Division's 110th Regiment, was monitoring the deteriorating situation from his headquarters in the Hotel Claravallis in Clairvaux. He pushed up what reserves he still possessed to try and reinforce his companies defending the ridgeline and the villages behind. But resistance along the ridgeline eventually collapsed, and the Americans began to surrender in large numbers. Clavaux was soon in an uproar. A scratch force of defenders was manning positions scattered around the town as the Germans swiftly advanced towards them. The men were mostly from the 110th Regiment's 1st Battalion, primarily cooks, clerks, signalers, and other ancillary troops from headquarters and support companies, with some gunners from Cannon Company. Also present was the 103rd Engineer Battalion and the guns of the 109th Field Artillery Battalion. There were also doctors and medics from Companies B and D, 103rd Medical Battalion, staffing an aid station that was already overwhelmed by wounded. Many stragglers from units smashed in the fighting hardly paused in Clavaux, despite the orders of senior officers, and continued to withdraw west in a routed panic. To stop what was coming would require more than just infantry supplied with rifles and grenades. To fight tanks, tanks or tank destroyers were required. About 30 Shermans were operating in and around Clavaux, drawn from two units, Company A, 707th Tank Battalion, attached to the 28th Infantry Division, and others from Company B, 2nd Tank Battalion, 9th Armoured Division. A special defence unit was established inside the castle, commanded by Captain Clark Mackey of Headquarters Company. Mackey had in total 102 officers and men, and remained in contact with Colonel Fuller at the Hotel Claravallis by radio and telephone. It was imperative that the men of the castle, the hotel, and in other scattered positions around the town stop the Germans, or at least delay them long enough to prevent them from reaching Bastogne in a timely manner, and also to allow fresh US forces to come up to counterattack. German shells began arriving in Clairvaux like express trains, their booming detonations sounding across the town as houses were blasted into smoking ruins and dirty black and yellow holes were gouged out of the white snowy fields nearby. The Germans were softening up the town before launching their assault. The castle rocked at each near miss and occasionally a shell struck its ancient walls with a deafening roar. Then, at 0930 hours, word arrived that German armour was cautiously approaching Clavaux. The shelling stopped as abruptly as it had begun. The first German battle group from the 2nd Panzer Division arrived soon after and slowly began attempting to work its way down the set of three hairpin bends along a road descending from a ridge outside the town into Clavaux. Two platoons of Panzer IV tanks from the 3rd Panzer Regiment were supported by about 30 half-tracks, carrying a battalion of the 2nd Panzer Grenadier Regiment dressed in whitewashed steel helmets and snowsuits. Also supporting the assault were squat little German Stug III assault guns from the 38th Panzer Jäger Abteilung. But there was a surprise in store for the Panzers. Defending each of the hairpin bends was an M4 Sherman tank, waiting for a German tank to come around the corner. They were under the command of Lieutenant Raymond E. Flaig. Flaig's first chairman was parked in front of a large, gloomy Victorian sanatorium building located beside the first bend. There was a brief exchange of fire before the Sherman burst into flames. The German armour ground on past the sanatorium's cemetery and approached the second hairpin on the icy road. Here, low and well covered, sat the second American tank. A German tank was knocked out, but another nosed around, turning into the bend. 
The German fired a second after the American. The Sherman was hit and exploded. Now only the third U.S. tank remained, guarding the third and final hairpin bend. It was all that stood between the advancing Germans and the town. The last Sherman tank defending the road into town engaged the advancing German armor, but it was an unequal duel. The Sherman suddenly went up in flames. German armor was pushing the burning German and American tank hulks aside and making a renewed effort to advance down the winding road from the south into Claveau. The Americans still had tanks, but they were heavily outnumbered. A Sherman in the town and another on the approach ramp to the castle opened fire at the German panzers. As their first rounds pinged off the leading Stug, but a shot soon found its mark and the Stug lurched to a halt. With the burning vehicles now blocking the road into town, the German advance ground to a halt, for now at least. Reports were soon reaching Colonel Fuller in Clavaux that though the German advance down the main road from Marnac had been temporarily stopped, a further force of panzers, this time including heavy 45-ton panther tanks and more panzer grenadiers, was assaulting the Clavaux railroad station north of the town, where a platoon of five Shermans from 3rd Platoon, Company B, 2nd Tank Battalion were holding out. Inside the railroad depot, the Americans had set up a battalion aid station that was crammed with wounded. Colonel Fuller was, by mid-morning, a very worried man. He called the 28th Division commander, wanting to speak to Major General Dutch Cota. Instead, he had to go through Cota's chief of staff, Colonel Jesse Gibney. It's hopeless here, shouted Fuller down the crackling line. I want permission to pull back everything I can and defend along the high ground west of town. Impossible, snapped back Gibney, horrified. Your orders are to defend in place. Don't give up any ground, do you hear? Let me speak to General Cota, demanded Fuller. The general's at dinner and can't be reached by phone, shot back Gibney. At that point, an officer burst into Fuller's room, his eyes wide. Colonel, he cried, six kraut tanks are coming down the street from the castle. This made up Fuller's mind. He pressed the telephone receiver back to his ear and spoke. All right, Gibney, you're transmitting the general's orders, and I've got to obey them. But I'm telling you, it's going to be the Alamo all over again. He had barely finished his sentence when the roar of tank fire from close by outside rocked the building. The platoon of Shermans fighting around Clavaux Railroad Station held on grimly under intense German panzer and anti-tank fire, but it was an uneven fight. A ring of Krupp steel was being squeezed around Fuller's remaining defensive positions in the centre of town. The Sherman tank by the entrance to the castle was rocked on its tracks as a high-velocity German tank shell penetrated its armour with an ear-splitting thump. It burst into flames. By now, more and more German vehicles were appearing on the ridge opposite the castle, driving down the road from Marnac. The obstructions pushed to one side. The castle was under long-range machine gun fire, bullets peppering its facade, while American weapons spat back at any Germans that could be seen. White, snow-suited panzer grenadiers flitted through the trees as they descended on the town in force. Shortly after, German armour and infantry broke through into the centre of Clavaux town. A Panzerfaust anti-tank launcher took out a Sherman that was guarding Colonel Fuller's headquarters. Then, above the rattle of small arms fire, came a loud rumbling. A big German Panther tank crunched its way down the street towards the hotel, until it came to a halt right outside of the American headquarters. A shell roared through several walls before detonating, collapsing half of the hotel. In the radio room, Fuller knew that the end had now come. He telephoned General Cota's headquarters at 18.30 hours, coughing as he spoke to Colonel Gibney again. German armour is outside, yelled Fuller. I'm evacuating my headquarters. Fuller didn't discuss this issue any further. Grabbing their personal weapons, Fuller led a couple of dozen headquarters staff out of a back window and began scaling a rocky cliff behind the hotel. With the 110th Regiment's headquarters overrun, the only remaining active defensive position in Clairvaux was the castle, where 110 GIs were firing down at the approaching German infantry. It was now down to Captain Mackey and his collection of rear echelon personnel and infantry stragglers to fulfil General Cota's order. Hold at all costs. No retreat. Nobody comes back. German tanks and assault guns began to open heavy fire directly on the castle, which was already being raked by automatic fire. 
The longer that Mackie's unit could hold the castle, the longer the delay imposed on the advancing 2nd Panzer Division, and the greater the chance that vital crossroads further west at Bastogne could be denied to the Germans. The Germans had to subdue the castle. The night of the 17th to 18th of December 1944 proved to be a living hell for Captain Mackey and the defenders of Clovo Castle. The German fire was continuous and heavy as tanks and infantry pounded the ancient fortress with guns, mortars and machine guns. Captain Mackey's gallant men fought back with everything at their disposal, but the volume of fire soon thinned their ranks considerably. The castle's facade was scorched, peppered with bullet hits, its windows largely blown in, and the roofs, shaped like black witches' hats, were holed. But the defenders still spat fire and death at the advancing Germans, desperately trying to hold on for one more hour. Ammunition, food and water were dwindling fast. Sometime before daybreak on the 18th, the last operational Sherman tank took up position in the castle's outer courtyard. As light began to brighten the sky, the intensity of German fire directed at the castle increased. Bullets constantly slammed into its stout walls or ricocheted around its interior, while heavy tank shells blew out great chunks of masonry that fell into the snowy courtyards. The last Sherman tank was struck twice by German tank shells and destroyed. By the morning of the 18th of December, there were just 62 men still alive, manning the defences at Clovo Castle. Ammunition was nearly expended, and the water supply had broken down. Mackey could no longer contact his commanding officer. He made his decision. He and the defenders had done their duty. He would surrender. They had imposed a serious disruption to the careful German timetable, perhaps long enough to enable reserves to be brought forward to stop the Germans. The castle was burning when, under a white flag made from a dirty and torn tablecloth tied to a curtain pole, the bloodied and battered survivors of the castle battle filed out of the building with their hands high in the air. The battle for Clavaux had truly been an Ardennes Alamo. The story of the Battle of Clavaux in the Ardennes features in my new book, Operation Swallow, American Soldiers' Remarkable Escape from Berger Concentration Camp, available in all good bookshops in the US and UK from October, and also available in audio format. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also help support my channel at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box.